Well, good morning. Welcome to God's worship today at uh, Bethel Church, and uh, welcome to those who are joining us via live stream. We're glad that you're here with us as well. Um, before we um, turn our attention to our worship, um, let me make a couple of announcements in your bulletin. There's a uh, new t uh, teen and adult Sunday school class uh, coming up starting next week on uh, C.S. Lewis's book, Mere Christianity. It's a study in mere Christianity. It's a 16-week study, and I uh, want to encourage you, if you'd like to participate in that, to get hold of the book, because we're going to be reading that together and making some observations, and um, that, uh, that, that class is going to be uh, offered via Zoom, over Zoom, a uh, team taught by uh, myself and Trey Hammond, uh, who's not here today because he was COVID tested yesterday. So uh, pray for him. Um, uh, he's hoping that it will be uh, nothing, but he thought that uh, was feeling kind of under the weather and the symptoms were consistent. So he thought he had uh, better be tested. But we're looking forward to that starting next week at 7 p.m. And I hope you'll join us for that. Um, Bethel is going to be providing bagged dinners uh, for Tree of Life partners on March the 30th. So coming up the uh, end of, well, this coming month, starting tomorrow, uh, you can see your grape seed for the link to sign up to help. And uh, I'll tell you, in, in all of this thing that's happened over this past year, one of the things that I miss most is being able to go to the Tree of Life dinners to uh, provide the meals, but also to meet with those folks who come to be served by that, uh, to sit with them, to talk with them, to pray with them. And we're not able to do that. Tree of Life has got its own staff uh, doing that. But the, but the need for those meals has really uh, increased. And so uh, you can uh, talk to Debbie Sane if you'd like to help with that. We're providing these bag meals, and we meet here, we assemble them, and then we take them over and drop them off at uh, Tree of Life to help those who are in need. So um, would love to have you participate in that with us. It's a, it's a wonderful ministry that we're involved with. Um, last week... No, last day of February. Tomorrow starts March, right? And so it, it can't be long now, folks. It can't be long. We had, some, we had some, some, some beautiful gifts this past week, some really nice days out. I hope you got a chance to get outside. Uh, I did. I sat outside for a bit. And, um, and well, even though it's, uh, you know, kind of rainy today, this can't go on for much longer. So hang in there, hang in there. The nicer weather's coming. Um, we'll be able to open the windows and, and, and get together outside. And, um, and, and hopefully, I'm praying, I'm sure you are too, that the, uh, that, that the pandemic in one way or another will be passed in this coming year. But uh, let's turn our attention to God's worship and to help us prepare our hearts for that, our uh, musicians are going to uh, play some beautiful meditation music for us. Oh, and Mrs. Baker, welcome back. After, after your surgery, here she is back playing already. Please rise for the call to worship. Give praise to the Lord. Proclaim his name. Make known among the nations what he has done. Praise the Lord. 
Sing to him. Sing praise to him. Tell of all his wonderful acts. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Look, Look to, to the, the Lord, Lord and his strength. strength. Seek his, his face always. always. And let us open our service by singing the hymn number 42, El Shaddai. God, we thank you for calling us here this morning and ask for your blessings upon our congregation today. We desire nothing but your glory and honor, and we want all nations to know of the wondrous things you have done. May your name be praised by this body and by the world. We ask for the Holy Spirit to guide our worship of you today, and we pray it would be glorifying to you. We pray for the message delivered to us by your servant, Pastor Hammond, and ask that each of us would be edified in its hearing. We pray blessings would be upon the musicians, the deacons, the sound crew, who make it possible to share the joy found in Christ with those who cannot be here today, as well as those who have found us through the wonders of the World Wide Web. May all glory go to you and you alone. And we pray in the name of Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. commandments we call them that in english i'm not sure why in hebrew they're the asara davarim the 10 words 
Um, when that got translated into Greek, it was the Decalogoi, the Decalogue. The Decalogoi, the ten words. And if you look at every other translation, German, French, Dutch, it doesn't matter, it's ten words. Somehow, when it comes to English, we called it the Ten Commandments. I don't know, maybe that has to do something with this propensity that we have toward rules. But you know what's interesting about those ten words that I uh, read Sunday by Sunday usually, in terms of thinking about them as commandments, you know, the, the, um, the mood of, in, in language, the mood of commandment is the imperative. That's the mood of commandment, right? It's an imperative, do this or do that. Um, none of those ten words in the Hebrew are in the imperative. Not a single one of them. They're not commandments. What they do is they show a condition that's not realized but is to be realized. You understand that God says in those, as he starts, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of bondage. And when he says, you will have no other gods before me, he's not saying, you will do this. He's saying, and you are not yet what you are supposed to be, but you will be. I am the Lord your God who has redeemed you, and because I am and because I have, you will be this. If you understand that, you understand why Jesus told us that the summation of the law is love. To love the Lord your God with all your heart and mind and soul and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And, and you know, over the past week as I was thinking about that, something occurred to me that, I don't know, for me was pretty profound. That in the incarnation of the Son of God, my love for God and my love for neighbor have been melded into one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and mind and soul and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, this is the summing up of the law. As a congregation, let's pray together the prayer of confession, and then I'll give you some opportunity to pray silently to seek God's face and his grace in Christ. Let's pray together. The law and the prophets are summed up in this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength and love your neighbor as yourself. O oh God, in the incarnation of your Son, these loves meet so that love for God and love for my neighbor in the man Jesus Christ are not only linked, they are now one. Lord Jesus, you have called us to be perfect as our Father in heaven is perfect. And in the context of your teaching, you left us with no doubt that perfection consists in. It is the perfection of love. I repent of my lovelessness. Fill me with your spirit so that the love of God compels me. And take a few moments to pray silently and seek God's grace. The psalmist has told us, God has not dealt with us according to our sins. He's not rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his loving kindness toward those who fear him. 
as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Thank God for his great love to us. Let us together offer ourselves to God by using the response of reading using Psalm 111. Reading responsively. Praise the Lord. I will extol the Lord with all my heart in the council of the upright and in the assembly. Great are the works of the Lord. They are pondered by all who delight in them. Glorious and majestic are his deeds, and his righteousness endures forever. He has caused his wonders to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. He provides He has shown his people the power of his works, giving them the lands of other nations. The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. They are steadfast forever and ever, done in faithfulness and uprightness. He provided redemption for his people. He ordained his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who follow his precepts have good understanding. Thanks be to God at the reading of his word. We offer ourselves to God in giving to him of our tithes and our offerings. And of course, during uh, the pandemic, we can't do this at that time. We don't want to uh, pass that offering plate, but if you... Uh, would like to contribute to Bethel's ministry. There are plates in the back. You can also um, make an offering online at the website. Those two things usually go together, offering ourselves to God and giving to him of what he's blessed us with. We can't do those together now, but we shouldn't neglect offering ourselves to God because we can't physically give uh, together. And so let me encourage you to take a few moments now to offer yourselves to God. Giving God of our stuff, of our substance, really means nothing if we don't give him our hearts and ourselves. And If you're able to, please rise. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy God, we do praise you for all the blessings and good gifts that you've given to us. Uh, Lord, particularly in this time, you have provided for our needs and you've sustained us. You've blessed us, O oh Lord, so that we could bless others and be a blessing to others. And Father, we pray that as we do that, that we would bring glory to your name, would bless and praise your holy name. Through Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. And now let us confess together, using the Apostles' Creed, our faith, which is one faith, not just of Bethel, not just of the OP, but of all Christians who claim Christ as their own. I ask you, Christian, what is it you believe? I believe, I believe in, in God, God the, the Father, Father Almighty, Almighty, maker of, of heaven, heaven and earth, earth 
I believe, I believe in Jesus Christ, Christ his, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Let us now go to the one who can command all things, is concerned with each and every one of us personally, and provides all good and perfect gifts to each of us, even in the times of a global plant pandemic. Now let us pray. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, we lift up your holy and righteous name this morning, each with our whole heart, together in the company of this upright congregation. We seek out a right relationship with our Creator because our Creator loved us and established a personal relationship with each of us through the calling and the urging of the Holy Spirit upon our lives. It is because of your endless and unrelenting love for your creation you gave your Son, Jesus Christ, to be the ultimate sacrifice for our sins, a sacrifice we could never make because we are sinners and a sacrifice we can never repay as we have nothing of value to give you, our Heavenly Father. You, Father God, demonstrate your magnificence and grandeur each and every day through the work of your creation, not only through the people you have, you have made anew, but through the birds of the air and the fish of the sea and the beasts of the field. Your full splendor is in view for all, and your righteousness will endure forever. You have given us all we could ever need, and your continued provision for us is without measure as we are constantly seeing your work in our lives. The plans you have for us come to complete and perfect realization for our benefit and to your unmatched glory. And our greatest need, fulfilled by Christ, is the redemption given to us through his blood, which satisfied the covenant established with Abraham for all time. You, Father, are holy and awesome, and those who fear the Lord begin to have wisdom, and all who live for Christ have a good understanding. May your enduring name be praised forever and ever. Lord God, as sinners, we have nothing to present to you except for our own inadequate broken lives needing redemption. We are unable to restore ourselves without Christ. And a life without Christ does not lead to eternal glory in the heavenly spaces. You have promised to all who give themselves over to Christ and who call upon you as king who is over all. We pray, Father, for the continued intervention in our lives by the Holy Spirit to keep us strong in our faith, fill our hearts with love for our fellow men and women, and satisfy the God-sized hole in our lives we would have without you. We thank you, Holy Father for your consistent and constant love toward us, and that nothing happens to us or in our lives that you have not ordained to happen. All that is or occurs is part of the plan you set in motion when you determined to create the world and all that is in it and laid the foundations of everything that has or will ever come to pass. Through your mercy, you have blessed us beyond anything we warrant or deserve, and we are so thankful to you for it. We thank you, Father, that we are able to come to you each Sunday morning and worship you with our presence, our music, our sermon, and our service to you. We are so blessed to know our King, but not only that you are, but that your desire is to care for your children as no, as no other father can. Through the love of the Father, the gift of the Son, and the presence of the Holy Spirit, you are able to provide so much to us, giving us exactly what we need, when we need it, though deserve none of it. May your mercy and goodness reign supreme, and may those who do not know you as their Savior see your blessings showered upon your children and be truly desirous of the gifts only you can give, and may they cry out to you, acknowledging their sinful ways, and give their lives over to you. We pray for those in our congregation who continue to remain at home, 
concerned for their health due to the ongoing pandemic, and ask that you would be with them as they worship you at home and enable them to feel as if they are with us as one family, one body in our worship of you today. We pray for Anna and Justin Dorr and their two lovely children, one of whom we have yet to meet in person. We pray there would be no more interruptions to Justin's travel plans to return home to be with his family and the coming birth of their golden boy. We pray for Anna's health and all the issues the baby is facing, but we are comforted to know you hold all of them in your comforting arms. We pray for those who are still recovering from the effects of serious medical issues, such as Sue, Lally, and Emily, and we ask for your continued care and comfort for them. We pray for Rose as she continues to adjust to her new home in Maryland. We pray for Mickey, Pastor Hammond's brother-in-law, who was recently involved in a severe car accident. We pray for healing for him as well as comfort for his wife as they traverse this difficult ordeal. And through this, we pray they would be drawn ever closer to you. We pray for Glenn and those who are involved in the assemblage as they continue to work toward an agreement to complete the process with the neighbors to remove the restrictions on this land and allow for building in the future. We pray for Leesburg Councilwoman Suzanne Fox and ask that she would rely upon you for guidance in her responsibilities and decision making as one of the elected leaders in the town of Leesburg. We pray for the home missions work of Ethan and Catherine Bulliard in Wilmington, North Carolina and pray the building renovation for Heritage OPC would complete in the next few months and that they would become a particularized congregation of the OP. We pray for the foreign missionaries, Jerry and Marilyn Farnick, who serve you in Prague of the Czech Republic. We pray their ministry would thrive even though the challenges of COVID-19 have been particularly difficult in the region and the English classes they have would provide opportunities to reach the lost with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, you are almighty, you are merciful, and you are the one true holy God above all and in all and through all. May your name be praised forever and ever by all men and women, boys and girls, and may your righteous kingdom, the new Jerusalem, be established in the fulfillment of your promises, and may Christ return to reclaim all who rely upon his blood for their righteousness according to your good and perfect timing. Good and upright is the Lord, therefore he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. And we pray, Heavenly Father, we would always be a people who would keep your covenant and keep your testimonies. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who is in him, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we prepare our hearts to hear the sermon this morning, let us rise together and sing the hymn, Christian Hearts and Love United, verses 1 and 2.
Please be seated. You know, it's uh, been said, if you ever find the perfect church, don't go to it because you'll ruin it. Right? And that's a recognition of the fact that we're imperfect people. Um, not imperfect merely because of our sin, but imperfect because none of us are mature yet. We're not yet what we're to be. And there are no perfect churches because churches are made up of imperfect people. And yet the fact that we recognize that there is imperfection means that we must have some idea of what perfection is to measure it against. That's how we know that things are imperfect. And so I want to ask you this morning to think about what would the perfect church look like? What do you think? Um, what features would it have? What would top the list? Would it be doctrinal precision? Or would it be excellence in the exercise of gifts? Uh, would it be a certain kind of music? Would it be the oratory skill of the preacher? Maybe, you know, preferably with a British or Scottish accent. Would it be a political leaning? Or an ethnic diversity? Or community involvement? Or would the perfect church be of a specific size? What would the perfect church look like? You know, that was a question, it seems like, that was on the mind of the church at Corinth. And I think that Paul is answering that question for them in 1 Corinthians 13. I want to read for you this morning. This is God's word. If I speak in the tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I'm nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. Now we see, but a poor reflection is in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Now, Father, the Lord Jesus told us, be perfect even as your Father in heaven is perfect. And uh, Lord, within the context of what Jesus said, and then really the rest of the context of your word, you tell us what that means and where it's to be found. So 
by your spirit working in us and through your word. Help us to press on to that perfection. Through Jesus our Lord, amen. Well, Corinth, you know, if you've been, if you've been following along and reading this letter to the Corinthians, Corinth was far from a perfect church. It was a church that was riddled with problems. You know, I've got uh, friends of mine uh, who go to a church, and, and we are able to have good-natured discussions. And, you know, at my friend's church, they, they, they base some of the practices of their church on some peculiar things that we find only in the letter to the Corinthians. And I said to my friend, I said, you, you sure you want to base church practices on what the Corinthian church is doing? Right? I mean, this was a church that was full of problems. It might be an exaggeration to say, if you want to do church right, look at the church at Corinth and do the opposite. That might be an exaggeration, but it's not much of one. It wasn't that they were a complacent church. Now, they were, in fact, a very zealous church. They cared a great deal as we've gone uh, through the book and have looked the letter and looked at it, uh, that, they, that they cared who had the best teaching among them. Who were the best teachers? Who had the greatest gifts? Who of us is the most spiritual? Which of us has God's approval? It's me, you know, and not you. And, and so they were looking for this perfection. The problem is that they were looking for perfection in the wrong places. Perfecting our gifts will not make for a perfect church. Let, let me ask you again, what would a perfect church look like? Would it be one where people had incredible gifts for eloquently and persuasively speaking the truth? Would it be one in which people had extraordinary insight into an understanding of God's Word? Would it be one where people had extraordinary faith? Or one where people gave sacrificially so that there never was any need and there was nothing that they couldn't do or accomplish because they were underfunded? Or would it be one where people were ready to die for testimony to their faith? You know, all of those things would be impressive and admirable, I think, if we were to find a church that exhibited those characteristics. But by themselves, they would not make for a perfect church. In fact, by themselves, they would move the church further away from perfection. See, it's not merely whether people have a skillful insight into God's Word, and not merely whether they have skill in communicating it clearly. That's what Paul's talking about when he said, if I, if I were never so eloquent, if I could speak in the tongues of men and angels, well, let me, let me show you. Paul gives an example here. I can, I can show it to you here. This, I don't know if you can see the profile of this. This is a, this is a really neat symbol. They don't, they don't make these anymore. And, they, and, it's, and it's really neat because it's got all these different sounds along it. Can you hear all those different sounds? Can you hear them? How long could you sit there and listen to me do that? Five minutes, three minutes, 45 seconds? What if, I, uh, what if I worked on my skill and could play that better? Could you sit longer? Probably not. Right? Did, did, you see what, did you see what Paul says? 
He says, if I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but I have not love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. You know, over the, the years that I've walked with the Lord, I've been, yeah, followed him, it seems like, to four states. I've lived in four states. And I, you know, I've gone to various churches, numerous churches. And I remember a church that I went to one time where I was really impressed with, uh, with the people there. They, they seemed very knowledgeable and skillful. The pastor uh, was, a, was a great orator. And I was really taken. But, you know, after I was there for a while, I began to notice that there was a lot of bitterness and a lot of backbiting and a lot of infighting and a lot of jealousy and a lot of superiority and a lot of looking down on other Christians who were not them. And after a while, that beautiful teaching <laughs> just started sounding like that. Right? That's what Paul's talking about. If I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but I have not love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. See, the question is not merely what's the message, what do people say, it's what's the motive. In Paul's letter to the Philippians, he he says this. He says, I, I, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. As a result, it's become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. So you, so you get this, Paul is in prison, and it's become clear to everyone that he's in prison, not because he's a bad person, not because he's done anything criminal, because, but because he's made a disturbance, because he was proclaiming Christ. And, and listen to what Paul says. He says, because of my chains, most of the brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly. It's an interesting thing that you think that they might be more fearful when they saw what happened to Paul, but Paul says, no, they've been, they've been more emboldened to speak the word of God courageously and fearlessly. Now listen to this. He says, it is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so in love, knowing that I'm put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely supposing they can stir up trouble for me while I'm in my chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached, and because of this I rejoice, yes, and I will continue to rejoice. So there's some there around Philippi, or when Paul writes to the Philippians, uh, who were preaching Christ out of envy and strife and rivalry, seeking to top Paul or to cause him trouble. Are they saying what's false? No. Paul says, I, in fact, I rejoice in what they're saying. I'm glad that Christ is preached. It's not that what they're saying is false. Their motive is false. What's the motive of those who, uh, or what's the true motive of those who are uh, truly preaching? And did you see what he said there, or hear what he said? He said, others preach Christ out of goodwill. These do so in love. Right? Paul says, if I speak with the tongues of men and angels, if I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, if I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but I have not truth, now that's not what Paul says. Truth is important, but that's not what he says. If I do all these things, but I have not faith. Now, now, faith is important, but that's not what Paul says. If I do all these things, but I have not zeal, I'm not enthusiastic to do it, I just do it because I have to. Well, no, zeal is important. But Paul says, if I have not love. If I speak in the tongues of men and angels but have not love, 
I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and I surrender my body to the flames but have not love, I gain nothing. If you want to make progress toward being a perfect church, focus on perfecting your love. Now, what is love? That's a good question. Um, You're not going to find the answer to that question in Hollywood. You're not going to find the answer to that question in popular culture. In recent years, the halls of Congress have tried to answer that question. You're not going to find the answer there. The, the world doesn't have any real answer to that question because it doesn't have a point of reference to answer it. So about the best it can come up with, have you seen these signs that have these signs that say, love is love? Well, duh. It's like saying light is light or heat is heat. Well, Paul here doesn't give us a definition of love what he does is he describes what it looks like so that we have something to measure ourselves against and this is what he says love is patient think of the times that you're impatient why are you impatient think about that why are you impatient isn't it because you're not getting something you want in the time that you want it I'm not getting something that I want in the time that I want it. That's what causes impatience. Impatience is focused on self, what I'm getting. Patience, when we're patient with somebody, we're focused on other. Love is kind. And kindness has to do with not causing someone unnecessary pain or discomfort. And and that takes effort, you know, sometimes, not to cause somebody unnecessary pain or discomfort. It's it's an effort that that we cannot make when we're self-focused. Kindness requires focus on the other. Most of what Paul says here, though, is negative. Did you notice that? It's what, what love is not. It does not boast. It is not proud or arrogant. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. Love does not keep a list or a record or a tally of wrongs that it suffered. Love does not delight in evil even when the outcomes of the evil bring me some advantage does not delight in evil but rejoices with the truth always even when that truth is uncomfortable or inconvenient for me love always protects that it is that is it defends others it always trusts, it, it thinks the best of others, not the worst of them. It always hopes, and it always perseveres. It doesn't fail. It doesn't quit. It's a description of love. Can we define love? Is there a definition we could give to love. I'm going to give you one. If you're somebody who writes and takes notes, you might want to write this down. Love is the disposition of being other-focused and self-forfeiting. Let me say it again. Love is the disposition of being other-focused and self-forfeiting. Now, you say, now, now, where did that definition come from? Well, It's a conclusion that I drew, and it's a conclusion that I drew from a statement that the Apostle John makes in 1 John 4, 8, and that statement is, God is love. 
God is love. You see, God in his very nature and being is other-focused. And, and, and what we see in the New Testament and in, and in, the, and in the, the clear revelation of this strange doctrine that's come to be called the Trinity, that there's one God who eternally exists in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that these persons are focused on one another. You see it, for example, in John 17, as Jesus prays, he says, Father, the hour has come, glorify your Son, so that your Son may glorify you. The Father is focused on the Son, and the Son is focused on the Father. In Matthew chapter 4, we see God saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. The father is focused upon the son. In John 8, Jesus said, if I glorify myself, my glory means nothing. Jesus is not focused upon himself. My father, whom you claim is your God, he is the one who glorifies me. The father is focused on the son. And in John 16, Jesus said, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak of himself, but whatever he hears, he will speak. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine, therefore I said that the spirit will take what is mine and declare it to you. That the, that the spirit is not here among us to draw attention to himself, but he's focused upon Christ. And I'll tell you that as you read through the New Testament, you just see this over and over again. Um, the opening of John's gospel, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Those are very famous words, right? The, the, the Word, when it says the Word was with God, and the Word was God, the Word was with God. You know, there are a couple of words in uh, the language of the New Testament that we could translate with. One means to be with, like to be side by side with someone, and you could think of people maybe walking along being side by side. There's another word, it's the word that's used here. It means to be facing someone. And that's the word that John uses. And the word was with God, and the word was God. And you know, the other day, looking through some old pictures, I came uh, across a, a picture of my firstborn son when he was little. It must have been maybe three or four years old, sitting on my lap. And the, and the picture is there of me looking full in his face and he looking full in mine. And, and I could see even in that picture, it brought me back to that time, I was just completely focused on him and delighted in him and you could see by the look on his face he was just completely focused on me and delighted in me god in his very nature and being is other focused and what we see in the coming of christ among us is that god is self-forfeiting for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And Christ gives his life up on the cross, forfeits himself, sacrifices himself to bring us to God. What do the scriptures say? He died once for all, the just for the unjust, to bring you to God. That while we were yet enemies, Christ died to reconcile us. To God, and, and so we think of the uh, of the cost to the Son to reconcile us to God. But did you ever think in those words in John three sixteen of the cost of the fa the cost to the Father, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. God is love. 
He's other-focused, and he's self-forfeiting. If you want to make progress toward being a perfect church, focus on perfecting your love. Perfection is found not in the perfecting of gifts, but in the progressing of love. Now, you know, that perfection, the word means maturity. It means full maturity. It isn't going to come until Christ comes. The Apostle John in 1 John 3, 2 writes, and I love these words, he says, his beloved friends, he says, now we are children of God. And it's not yet appeared what we shall be. But when he appears, we will be like him because we will behold him just as he is. And, and you know, I, so much of what we so often think makes for perfection and maturity will look childish. Paul says here, when I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. Now we see but a poor reflection is in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And and, and think of... Back to when you were a child, what you thought adulthood was like. Is it anything like that? Your your view of adulthood was childish, right? When we were children, all of our ideas were childish. And and those things that seem important now are things that we see as a poor reflection in a mirror. Even as I, as, as I look back over the span of, of my short life so far, things that I used to think were so important, I realize now just not that important. And, and it's like seeing things in a poor reflection. By the way, you know, this is, I think, hard for us to understand what Paul's talking about because um, you all have good mirrors compared to the ancient world you have very high quality mirrors even if you've got like a walmart mirror it's a high quality mirror uh, by comparison um in the ancient world only very rich people had mirrors made of glass um, most most mirrors were polished metal and so if you want an analogy think of catching a glimpse of yourself in the reflection of a car door on a sunny day and that's what paul is talking about we, we see as, um, in a mirror, a poor reflection. It's not that we can't see it at all, it's that we don't see well. And, and let me tell you that it's not that things, like Paul has mentioned here, of, of, of faith and speaking with the tongues of men and angels and um, uh, having gifts to fathom all mysteries and all knowledge. It's not that Paul saying those things are unimportant. But without love, they're worthless. So, see, the goal here is not to know things. It's to know God. In, in fact, you, you get a glimpse of that. Don't you? Do you have a sense of that when you read this? Now we shall see... Or, or I'm sorry, now we see, but a poor reflection is in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know, even as I am fully known. I'm not talking about God knowing things about us. He's talking about God knowing us. The knowledge that he's talking about is not knowing things. It's knowing God. And the things that, that matter most, Paul says at the end of this, are, are faith or hope and love. And there's a sense, I suppose, that faith and the sense of trust will last forever, but the faith that he talks about here is not something that will last forever. Because as we're told by the writer of the Hebrews in Hebrews 11.1, 1, that faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. Yet, 
but we will see them. And hope remains, but hope isn't forever. That the day will come when the things that we have hoped for will be realized. The Apostle Paul told us that in Romans 8.24. He says, hope that is seen is not hope. For why would one hope for what he has? Right, but love, that will never pass away. It's as eternal as God is. God is love. Love, not as the world misunderstands it, but but as it is defined by the very nature of God. The, The church is imperfect. What would a perfect church look like? When perfection came, what would it look like? If you want to make progress toward being a perfect church, focus on perfecting your love. Father, you uh, have told us in your word that you have shed the love of God abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Lord, fill us with that love for you and for one another. That, uh, Lord, we might press on to perfection. You know, I think of the context of Jesus telling us that, that, that we're to be perfect even as uh, our Father in heaven is perfect. And And there are many things that we might think that that means if we didn't have the context of what Jesus said. And he talks about how God has sent his reign on the just and the unjust alike and and how he loves. And, And so, Lord, may we press on to that perfection of love. May it be the, the, the zest and spice and flavor of everything that we do. Because the, the gifts that we exercise are, are nothing. In fact, the gifts that we exercise are annoying without love. And Lord, as we do that, help us to look like Jesus, be able to share uh, your love in him with others. Amen. As we conclude our worship this morning, uh, would you stand if you're able to and we'll sing blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in christian love found in your bulletin
Jesus said, all people will know that you are my disciples by your bumper stickers. No, that's not what he said. He said, uh, all people will know that you are my disciples by your virtue signaling. Yeah, I, don't, I don't think that was it either. Oh. He said, all people will know that you are my disciples by how much you complain in person and online and, and the things that people know that you're against. Now, I think he said, all people will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. You know, Paul wrote to Timothy, he said, but the goal of our instruction, here's the whole thing, Timothy, he's writing to young Pastor Timothy, here's what it's all about. The goal of our instruction is love from a pure faith and a sincere heart. Or if it's, uh, I'm sorry, in the, our goal, the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. For some, straying from these things have turned to fruitless discussion. The Lord bless you and keep you the Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and grant you peace. Amen. Amen.